So what's the two most important parts of any sermon or speech? But we all, the beginning and the end. That's exactly right. So you want to have a really good beginning, no technical problems or anything like that. And then you really put a lot of thought at your ending because that's what you figure people are going to remember. And we have been looking at this uh, upper room discourse for months. It's four chapters. It's a big chunk of the Gospel of John. And today we're finally going to be studying his last words to the disciples before he's betrayed and tried and persecuted and shamed and crucified. Now, his opening was rather stellar. He began with washing the disciples' feet and then celebrating the Passover and instituting communion. That was his opening. And then when he starts to talk to them for, for the next four chapters, he says, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So he understood as he was telling his disciples that the Messiah was going to have to die and he was going to be separated from them, that they were anxious about their own mortality. And as he speaks to the disciples, he really speaks to us too, because this is the test of all of our faith. We live our life differently if we believe his promise that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And so with that, he gets their attention, and then he tells them that what they expect is not what they're going to receive. The disciples have a problem in that they're at cross purposes with Jesus. It manifested earlier when Jesus first began to hint that the idea that he would be arrested and, and, uh, and really tried and, and killed. And Peter interrupts him and says, no, Lord, it'll never happen. I, I won't let it happen. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. That was quite a, a reproof. But what was the problem? Is they were at cross purposes with Jesus. God had his plan for the Messiah, and it was that he would be cut off from the land of the living. They had their plan of a Messiah, that they he was going to usher in a new golden age for Israel and vanquish Rome and any other power. And this is what they were looking to get a cabinet post. And they were jockeying for position. And he says, no, no, you're not greater than your master. I came to lead by washing your feet. Later he says, you're not greater than a master. Uh, I came to serve and, and the world hated me. And it's going to hate you too. This is not everything they wanted to hear. But he tells them, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then I can't send to you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And remember he said, apart from me and the Comforter, apart from me, you can do nothing. And finally, he tells them that his, their relationship with the Father is going to be much more direct. They're not going to have to come to Jesus anymore. This is how it would work for them when they were with Jesus. They'd have a need and they'd say, oh, Jesus, uh, talk to the Father. <coughs> Jesus spent all that time in prayer. You have a notion. He was taking their request to the Lord. He says, not anymore. Once the, Spirit, once the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to go to the Father directly and ask whatever you want in my name, meaning to advance my kingdom, and you're going to get it. It's a whole new relationship that he's ushering in. This is what he's telling them. And he finally says it plainly to them. And this is their response. Let's pray. Father, uh, we find ourselves oftentimes in our lives at cross purposes with you. And it, it's hard to let go. And it's hard to trust you, Lord. We have our plans and our dreams. And to surrender them to you, uh, we need your spirit. But to... To get our best plans that aren't your plans would be far worse. So as the disciples discover this, help us to discover it too. Make this word fresh to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So his disciples finally say to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Now, that's a rather 
uh, incredible statement of faith, isn't it? They say, they say, we know that you know all things. Who knows all things? God. Especially in the Jewish mindset, there's but one that knows all things, and that's God. And they affirm, they get it. We believe that you came from God. Remember Jesus offered up the I am statement before Abraham was, I am. It was such a claim to deity that the, the Jewish leaders who were misinterpreting the word began to pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. So they make this confession of faith and Jesus answers. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And it's Jerry's favorite verse. And I didn't even know you were going to preach on that. I remember being in the dollar store once, and uh, there was a gal, she was a little gal, she was wearing a cross. And so I said, oh, I like your cross. And then she goes, oh, what do you do? I don't like that question. Usually I like to keep it a secret so I can talk to folks. And I said, well, I pastor a little church in Encinitas. And she goes, oh, really? What's your favorite verse? I didn't have a favorite verse. <laughs> I just went, started, you know, buffering through my mind. <laughs> older I get, the longer I buffer. But this, if, you don't have, if you don't have a favorite verse, this is a great verse. This is an amazing verse. It was important to Jesus because this is the last verse before he goes into this amazing prayer to the Father in chapter 17. Most remarkable prayer probably in the whole Bible. But at the end of this discourse with his disciples, the last thing he tells them before he goes to uh, be betrayed and, and mocked and crucified is this verse. And notice that the disciples, they're trying so hard. Now we believe. Yes, we believe. Really? Because in a moment, you're going to be scattered. And I take uh, comfort in this, that the disciples who spent all that time with Jesus, they have such a hard time getting it. And, and they even fail. And that speaks to me a lot because I have a hard time getting it. And I often fail. And how often we look back, we, you know, we might look back with regrets. And that was such a temptation for these disciples to go, oh, Jesus, when you really wanted us there, we couldn't even stay awake. And yet he saw in them, he, he never told Peter, oh, you're not going to be the rock anymore because you denied me three times. No, he restored him. Part of, part of Peter being able to walk in victory was that he had stumbled and knew the grace of Jesus. So it's not that Jesus uh, wants to see us fall, but I think he knows that if we're going to walk, we're going to have to fall. And, uh, you know, it's rough to teach our kids to ride a bike because we know they're, or a skateboard or all the crazy things the kids do. Kind of scary to let them fall, but that's the only way they can learn. And, and I think that's what Jesus is teaching his disciples on this very difficult night. He says, I am not alone because the Father is with me. I was thinking about this, especially comparing it to what Jesus said on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is he alone or is God with him? Well, let's look at that verse for a minute. It comes out of Psalm 22, amazing chapter. Uh, before, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said these words before the, the psalm was ever called Psalm 22. That wasn't added till a thousand years later. But they would call the psalms by the first line. So this, this, this psalm would have been the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me psalm? That was its title. And so there were plenty of people who would have been there with the whole psalm memorized. I like it because it, means that Jesus, it's okay for Jesus to ask why. Why have you forsaken me? Because really, uh, I don't know that he knew why. I don't think he knew why. I think he knew the result, the consequence, but I don't think he knew 
why it couldn't be that God just couldn't use a magic wand and take away our sins. He prayed in the garden, if there's any way that this cup would not pass before me, Lord, I'd like that. But not my will, your will be done. I'm glad he does that, not knowing why, because that's the hardest part of our faith, is when we, we obey the Lord even when it's not what we want to do. Even when we'd rather have an alternate plan, even when we would rather uh, not uh, abstain from some sin, when we'd rather not abide by some duty, when it's difficult to give or to love, that's when we really have to exercise faith. When it doesn't make sense to us, that's when we exercise faith. But Jesus had even more in mind because this psalm goes on. If you ever get a chance to look it over, it's a brilliant prophecy. Uh, it talks. Uh, it describes the crucifixion about his his tongue sticking to his roof of his mouth, and they they pierce his hands and his feet. It describes crucifixion a thousand years before the Romans had invented it. And then it says, they even cast lots for my clothing. And it talks about the crowds jeering at him. If God loves him, let him save him, just like is recorded in Matthew. But after it explains the crucifixion, and of course, David, who wrote this, an ancestor of Jesus, was never, never had his hands and feet pierced. He was never surrounded by a, a, a circle of Gentiles. But after it goes through all this, the psalm ends up being a very victorious psalm. So even though Jesus said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Look what happens in verse 24. The psalm says, for he has not, for God has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Jesus was not alone. Then look at the result of the event. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Can you think of any event in Jewish history that would cause all the nations to worship God? They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. So even though it might seem like Jesus is equivocating, it was really a great statement of faith when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus says rightly, he's not alone. But I want to focus today on this, which could really be a favorite verse, not just for Jerry, but for anybody who's asked, what's your favorite verse? John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you. What things is he talking about? I think he's talking about the whole upper discourse how important it is that they abide in the word and the word abide in them. That apart from him, they can do nothing of eternal significance. That they're going to receive the comforter that's going to guide them in all truth. That they're going to not see Jesus for a little while, and then they'll see him for a little while. And it's to their advantage that he goes away. These things I've spoken to you. He's trying to tell them the things that they're going to need when their world turns upside down. They're at cross purposes with Jesus. They want Jesus to stay. Imagine if you went to a buffet, you go to a buffet and you know how we were really good at piling it on and we, we start putting all the things we want and everything looks so good. You kind of map it out on your plate and it gets higher and higher. Imagine if you take the time to build that plate and then just as you're ready to go to your table, somebody says, uh, 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 that's bad for you. Can't have that. Are you kidding me? Well, these disciples, they have been building up in their mind how this Messiah that they've been following is going to usher in this golden age for Israel. And Jesus is saying, no, maybe not. You know, our relationship, close as we are, I have to leave you now. I have to be betrayed and crucified. And all these plans you had, no, the world's going to hate you. <laughs> You're not going to reign with me right now. The world's going to hate you like it hated me. And so be of good cheer. You're going to have peace with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Shalom. 
is, is a big theme in the Jewish culture and in the Old Testament. Shalom is a peace that says things are the way they ought to be. You're at peace with God. In me, you have shalom. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Sometimes I think when we preach the gospel and we talk about grace and we talk about being in relationship with God, we get the sense of then everything's going to be okay. Just walk forward and accept Jesus. And now all your troubles are behind you. That's not what Jesus says. He says, no, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have, remember, he just told them, people are going to kill you and think they're serving God. They're going to kick you out of the synagogues. You're going to be marginalized and mistreated and even martyred. But that's the plan. In this world, you will have tribulation. Everybody has got trouble. They used to say, if you want to meet people that don't have any troubles, go to the cemetery. Because we all got troubles. To be alive is to have troubles in this fallen world, but we can have shalom in the midst of our troubles. We can have peace with God in the midst of troubles. Be of good cheer. Take courage. It's kind of a, it, it's a, it's a command. Take courage. I have overcome the world. So today, as I'm preaching this, I'm thinking about my troubles. <laughs> and maybe you're thinking of your troubles too. Maybe that's a good sermon for folks today because we all have troubles. And we can look back at times when God took troubles and worked it out. And there's an ultimate sense that he's going to take all our troubles and, and he's got a promise that we're going to be shaped into the likeness of his son. That's his purpose for us. Let me show you how Paul puts it. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. He says we know this, but man, that's a hard one to know. To those who are called according to his purpose. That's the, that's the rub, isn't it? When my purpose is that I should be successful and powerful and healthy and strong, and his purpose is, no, you should be shaped into the image of my son. That's his purpose for us. It's way higher than anything we could dream up. Paul goes on, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. That's his plan for you. It's way better. Sometimes it just is so difficult, though, to hear it. This book on the Holy Spirit, written by Pastor Randy Hurst, called The Helper, The Divine Empowerment for Everyday Living. And in this book, he gives a clever little illustration of a third world country that was given a satellite dish from the United States so they could be connected to the world, really. And the government officer who was in charge of this dish that has to move, you know, it has big motors to move it to keep it on track. He thought, you know, it's probably best to turn it off at night and give it a rest. Keep the motors from being burned out. We want to get the longevity out of this machine. So he turned it off at night. And the next day when he turned it on, the dish had to search for the signal. And it spent the whole morning searching for the signal and the motor wore out. <laughs> because... The dish was not meant to be off and on. It was meant to be in continual connection and just keep its bearings. And that's how we're made too. So in 1 John, we realize that our relationship with God is never broken, but our fellowship with God can be broken. And when we're at cross purposes with God, we're really breaking our fellowship and we're disconnecting. And then when tribulations come, boy, we're in a worse situation than if we've been walking with him the whole time. And sometimes these tribulations are such that it takes a lot of faith to trust God when we can't see any silver lining in the cloud. 
There's a little girl that was, she was diagnosed with cancer at a young five years old. And she's sitting on her mom's lap and watching TV. And she looks up at her mom and says, because the girl knows she's got a bad diagnosis too. And she asks her mom, mommy, does dying hurt? And the mother did not know what to say. So she got up for a moment, excused herself, and went to the bathroom to weep. And she called out to God. And she'd been calling out to God a lot. And she said, please give me words for my daughter. And she came back and she sat down, took the child on her lap and said, you know what it's like? It's like, how many times do you fall asleep watching TV? And then you wake up the next day in your warm little bed. Do you ever wonder how that happens? She said, what happens after you fall asleep, you go to sleep on the couch here. Then your dad with his big, strong arms sweeps you up and puts you in and tucks you into your bed. And then all of a sudden you wake up in the morning warm. Well, she says, that's what it's like. You're going to just, uh, the Lord's going to usher you out of this life. And then next thing you know, you're going to be in his presence. And it was an illustration that the girl could understand. And she took comfort in it. So how are we going to have words of comfort for ourselves and for the real tribulations that come to us in the people we love? We want to be connected. We want to stay connected so that in these moments of consolation, God can be glorified and we can be used. Jesus in his prayer that we're going to study next week says, it's not my desire that you take them out of the world, but you leave them in the world and you protect them from the evil one so that other people can see that they love me and I love them and they love each other. And then they'll know that I was sent from you. So we're here not to live a life without tribulation, not to be the healthiest, wealthiest of them all, but we're here to do God's work so that people would know that Jesus came as a ransom for our sin, to reconcile us to God, that close relationship with God. You know, last week I talked about this, and, and Jesus said, I, he's explaining to them, you'll see me a little while. After that, you won't see me. And then I go... What do he say? I go, I go to my, I go, does he say I go to heaven? To my father's. I go to my father. You know, I think if I were telling the story, I'd say Jesus told him he was going to go to heaven because we all want to go to heaven. But Jesus says, no, I go to the father. And so I heard it described this week on a sermon. It was a great sermon by this fellow from London who had the strongest Cockney accent it just was enjoyable to listen to him and kind of humorous. But he was explaining it, and I loved it. He said, there's a bloke <laughs> that has a pool that they all knew. And everybody would call this guy and say, hey, can we go to your pool? Hey, can I go in your pool tomorrow? When Can we all gather and go into your pool? And he says, you know what? He got tired of it because they never came to see him. They just came to see the pool. And, and we're all thinking, you know, this life is tough and you've promised to wipe away your tears. And when I die, will I go to heaven? We're looking forward to the pool. <laughs> and Jesus says, no, the greatest part about heaven is I'm there and you're there and the Father's there. It's the closeness. And he goes, and look, that closeness is going to be real to you when you receive the Holy Spirit. You can start that first taste that guarantee a heaven now when my presence is in you and you have purpose and meaning in this life and no fear of death. That's what these disciples experienced by faith. And that's the challenge that we have today when, when our cake crumbles. It, it is, you know, it talks about, I, oh, I think it's, I don't remember which book it is. But uh, one of the prophets says that he gives us, he gives us what, uh, beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. What'd you call that cake after you stirred it up for us? Trifle. Trifle for broken cake. 
You know, so we think about things being broken and we got to throw them away. But what if we're the thing that's broken and we bear the image of God? And he says, I don't just want to throw it away. I want to redeem it. I want to use it. I'm going to use you to build my kingdom. And we're here today because he's used other folks to present the gospel in such a way that we were persuaded and persuaded not so much by argument, but by what? People loved one another. Jesus says, love one another. By this, all men would know that I came from the Father. And that was what they said. We now know you came from the Father. James says uh, that we can get attuned to this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And I think, God, you know, I'd be happy to be just pretty good. <laughs> I don't really want the whole treatment, God. I, I'd rather just be okay. But God's plan for us and all the vicissitudes of life is to use them to shape us into the image of his son, that we would be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He has high ambitions for each one of us that are called according to his purpose. And when we have, when we're at cross purposes with him, we're thwarting his efforts. And yeah, we, you know, we've piled it on. We got all our dreams and plans and it takes faith to surrender it and go, you know what? You want to shape me into the image of your son. I got to let go of I got to let go of everything I've put in the buffet. And I'm going to trust you that your diet is going to be better for me. And what you give me might not be what I'm asking for, but can we trust him? Peter speaks to this and he says, don't be at cross purposes, cross purposes with God. And this is why he quotes the Psalms and say, says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we're prideful and we're trying to build our kingdom and we got our platter full and we're anxious and we're, we're trying to keep in control of our life, he says, God opposes the proud. He will be on the opposite team. <laughs> You're trying to take the field and who do you see on the other side? It's God. He's saying, you're going the wrong direction. Peter says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, if we are convinced that Jesus came from the Father, that he and the Father are one, and that his goal is that we would be one and loved even as the Father loves him, and if he's persuaded us, and Paul gives us a reason in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. If we're persuaded that he is who he said he was, that he loves us and he really does care, then it really is our step of faith to accept this and to cast our care upon him because he's trustworthy. We build our life, not on, we build our faith walk, not on our circumstances, but on God's promises and the love that he has lavished upon us. And sometimes when we go through these tribulation and there's things that we can't explain in this lifetime, we think, oh, do you not love me anymore? I don't feel loved right now. I, don't, I, I feel like I'm praying to this, you know, my, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I have all these feelings and suffering and hurt, but I also have faith. That, that can fix not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is what ought to be our motivation, our shalom, our joy, and our purpose in this life. So if we're floundering for joy and peace and purpose, we got to just refocus. We got to remember what he's done. And he's given us the example in that while he was being crucified and it didn't feel like it, he says in faith, I'm not alone. God is with me. One last blessing that's so hard to see when we're going through it, 
but we've all experienced it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So often we think we want to go to Jesus because he seems like the nice guy. Maybe we think God's a big dad upstairs and he might not be as gentle. But Paul says, no, here's a good name for him. Father of mercies, God of all comfort. That means a lot on the night when Jesus was betrayed. And that means a lot on our Good Fridays when we have them. Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the suffering of Christ, of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So I was listening to a sermon by Greg Laurie. You all know Greg Laurie, the Harvest Crusade guy. He's a great preacher. But this was a special sermon because he was giving it to preachers and teachers and Christian leaders. And it was a special sermon because he was preaching on this topic the year after his son was murdered. And he said, this is a sermon I wish I could never give. But he made a couple points that really stuck with me. And one thing he said is, I want to tell you after this year that all the things that we teach and preach about God being a comfort and giving us the power and the comfort to do the impossible, they're true. They're true. And yeah, I would love to undo it, he said. And if I could exchange right now and I'd be dead, my son would be here, I'd do it. But that's not what God had in mind. He had a different plate. And he said, the Holy Spirit has not disappointed me. And then the other thing he said, and this we know, is when we have been, he talked about all the things you shouldn't say. And all the people that tried to comfort him in ways that didn't work. He said, but the comfort that he does receive is from people who have lost a child. They're the ones who can comfort him. And then he says, and with the loss of his son, and I mean, this is a terrible case because his son had been strayed from the Lord and come back to the Lord, had a sweet little daughter, and his wife was pregnant with number two when he was just arbitrarily murdered. I think it was, well, I think it was a murder, but I heard it last night. I don't know. But the point is, it was a loss. And in that loss, he found the comfort of God, and he said people came to him. All kinds of hurting people were coming to him for his message. He said one person came to the Harvest Crusade because they had um, they'd heard that he was going to preach after losing his son, and they wanted to see if it was genuine and wanted to hear what he had to say. So uh, when we go through tribulation, we can trust in the promise of God. We can check ourselves that we're not in cross purposes with God, and we can prepare ourselves. You know what? God's going to use this in our lives, in this life and in the life to come. And it's an opportunity for us to shine like lights in the darkness of this fallen world. That's why we're here, by the way. He could take us home right now, but he has us here to build his kingdom. And the suffering and the comfort that we receive from God empowers us to build his kingdom. And that's a higher purpose. Let's pray. Father, today there might be somebody just absolutely sitting in ashes and feeling like their whole world's been turned upside down. And the temptation is to feel like you're not sovereign, you're not in control. But we know that's not your promise. Your promise is don't be afraid. I've prepared a place for you and I have overcome the world. And you commission us not to repay evil for evil, but to overcome evil with good. And that if we walk in faith and we believe this is true, we can be more than conquerors in this life. So as we are experiencing ashes today, Lord, we look back at the times when uh, we were broken and you made it work out okay. And you carried us through. It's your footprints in the sand. You carried us. And we can see how it works to the building of your kingdom. 
And we can see that now, after we're broken, we're more usable, more useful to you. And the joy of being used by you can be more realized in our life. And at the end, Lord, your design for us is to be like Christ. So, Lord, we pray that you would uh, empower us with your spirit to surrender our control, rejoice, uh, Lord, in, in even not because of the suffering, but despite the suffering, we rejoice because you're still in control. You're working it to our good, and we can, we can be more than conquerors, and people can see it because you're in us, working in us and through us, Lord, uh, to extend your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.